Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about systems of linear equations. A linear equation in two variables is something of the form ax plus by equals c, where a, b, c are all constant numbers. So all the capital letters we'll be seeing in this represent constant values. Notice that each of the variables has just a power of 1, right? We've got x to the 1 effectively, y to the 1 effectively, right? x to the nut, x without an exponent is the same thing as just saying x to the power of 1, right? So since each of these variables has a power of 1 that's similar to a linear polynomial which has a degree of 1. And so that's where we get this idea of calling it a linear equation is because everything has a degree of 1. It's not really a degree technically because it's not a polynomial, but there's sort of this parallel idea going on. All right, so here's some examples of it. Uh, 3x plus 2y equals 4, and x minus 5y equals 7. Both of these would be linear equations because they're just some constant times a variable plus some other constant times a variable until we equal finally some constant at the end. A system of equations is a group of multiple equations that are all true at the same time. So we have this equation here and this equation here, and we know that they're both going to be true at the same time. For example, the two equations above make up a system of linear equations. We put this, these two things together with each other, and we've got a system of linear equations. The solution is going to be some pair of x and y, two numbers where one is going to be x and the other one's going to be y, and we plug them both in and it will satisfy both equations at the same time. Time. Some x and y that's going to be true here and here in both of our equations at the same time. That's why we're fulfilling a system of equations as opposed to just one equation. Let's talk about graphs to start uh, to really get into this. So first, long ago, when we first discussed the concept of a graph, we saw there are two ways to look at it. We can talk about how input x is transformed into output y, right? So we can think if we plug in x at 1, then y is going to come out at 1 as well. If we plug in 2, y is going to come out as 4, right? 2 squared. We plug in 3, y is going to come out as 9, because 3 squared is 9, and so on and so on. We could also go backwards, 0, negative 1, all that sort of stuff. But alternatively, we can also think of it as the location of all the points that make the equation true. Where is this going to be true? So the reason why 0, comma 0 is a point on our graph is because if we plug that in, 0 equals 0 squared, hey, that checks out. If we try plugging in the point 1 comma 1, right, this point here, if we plug that in, we've got 1 equals 1 squared, hey, that checks out. If we try plugging in the point 2 comma 4, then we've got 4 equals 2 squared, and hey, that checks out. So all of the points on this parabola, the reason why these points are on the parabola, the, why, the reason why this graph is these points is because those points make the equation that makes that graph true. Any other point, if we were to choose some other point on it like 2 comma 1, if we plug that into our equation, we'd have 1 equals 2 squared. That's not true, right? This is not a true statement, so this point here does not exist, it's not on our graph. So the location of all the points that make the equation true is a great way of thinking about this. When working with systems of equations, it's useful to think of graphs in this second way. It will help us understand the connection between graphs and solutions. This way is still useful. It's a great way in general whenever we have to graph something. But for what we're doing right here with the systems of equations, this second way of thinking of the points that are true is going to really help us understand what's going on. We first want to put all the equations from the system into a form we can easily graph when we're going to graph this. So if we want to graph a system of equations, we first want to change these things that are kind of hard, like 3x plus 2y equals 4. That's not very easy to graph offhand. So we want y equals stuff, where that stuff is going to involve our x inside of it. y equals da 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 da, -da with our x over there, right? We can graph that easily. We're used to graphing lines like that all the time. So we've got 3x plus 2y equals 4. We can convert 3x plus 2y equals 4. This converts into this. Negative 3 halves x plus 2. You can work that out, right? We can get this as 2y equals negative 3x plus 4 by subtracting by 3x on both sides. Then we divide both sides by 2, and we get negative 3 halves x plus 4. And that winds up giving us 
that line right there. So that's what we get from this equation. So our red one is this one. Similarly, we can solve x minus 5y equals 7 for y to make it more easy to graph, and that winds up giving us this. So we've got both of these graphed together. Now, what does this tell us about a solution to the system? Where the graphs intersect, we have a solution to the system. So where they intersect, right here, we've got a solution. Why is that a solution? Well, what we're looking for is we're looking for a point. We're looking for some x comma y that is going to be true here and true here. And since this and this are just equivalent to these two equations up here, if we can find some x comma y that is true here and true here, then we found something that is going to be the answer to our system of equations. Well, any point that is on the graph is going to make the graph of an equation is going to make that equation true. So what we found here this point here is a point that is on both graphs. Since it's on both graphs, it must be true for both equations. So since it's a point on both graphs, it's true for both equations. So we've just found the solution at that point of intersection. With this idea in mind, we can see that there are three possibilities for solutions to a system of linear equations. The first one is independent. We call it independent if we've got just one solution. They intersect in just one place. So notice that they have to have different slopes for them to intersect in just one place. The next one is inconsistent. We say that a system of equations is inconsistent if they never intersect each other. Notice that they have the same slope but different intercepts. They're parallel lines, but they, you know, they don't intersect. They're parallel and they never touch each other in any way. They're not on top of each other. They're just parallel. So the system is inconsistent because if one equation is true, the other equation can't be true. There's no point that will be on both of the graphs, as thus there is no point that is going to fulfill both equations at the same time. And finally, a dependent system is a system where the two lines are just completely on top of each other. They are collinear. They are the same line. So in that case, they have the same slope, they're parallel, but they also have the same intercept, so they're actually just straight up the same line. So in the case where it's dependent, any point on either of them is going to be a solution because if it's a point on one of them, it's a point on the other one as well. So that gives us a total of three possibilities for how many solutions a linear system can have. One, one solution in the case where it's independent. Zero, zero in the case where it's inconsistent, they're parallel, they never touch. Or infinitely many in the case where it is a dependent system, where it's just the same line on top of itself, where anything that's going to be on it is going to be an answer to both equations. Now notice, I want to point out that just because it's dependent, just because there are infinitely many solutions, doesn't mean any point is a solution, right? If we consider that point there, it's not on either of our lines, so it's not going to be one of them. So a dependent system doesn't mean that every point is a solution. What it means is that all of the points on the line are going to be solutions because they're both just the same line. So if you find a point on one of the lines, you know it's going to work for the entire system because it's on both of the lines. But that doesn't mean that you've got just one point being true for everything, sorry, that any point whatsoever is going to be true for both of your equations, for all of your entire system. All right. First method to talk about finding that point, where is that point located of intersection, is through substitution. Substitution works by plugging in one variable for another. Then we solve the resulting equation. For example, consider if we've got 3x plus 2y equals 4 and x minus 5y equals 7. We want to begin by solving one equation for one variable in terms of the other, right? We want to be able to plug in y for x or x for y. So we have to get either y on its lonesome or x on its lonesome. Now, either equation and either variable will work. We're happy plugging in x just as we're happy plugging in y, so just choose whichever one looks easiest. Now, to me, it seems really easy to get x on its lonesome because all we have to do is add 5y to both sides. So we have x minus 5y equals 7. We add 5y to both sides, and we get x equals 5y plus 7. At this point, we're in a great position because we've got x here, we've got x here. We can swap out those x's, and we can get an equation that uses just y. 
So we substitute that into the other equation, right? We've got x equals 5y plus 7 here. We've got 3x plus 2y equals 4. So we swap out the x, and now I've got 3 times the quantity, because remember, we have to plug it in as a quantity, because it's not just 3 times 5y, it's not just 3 times 7, it's 3 times all of 5y plus 7, so we put it in with parentheses. 3 times the quantity, 5y plus 7 plus 2y equals 4. We simplify that up a bit. 3 times 5y, 15y plus 2y gets us 17y. 3 times 7 gets us 21. So we've got 17y plus 21 equals 4 subtract by 21 on both sides, then divide by 17, and finally we get to the answer y equals negative 1. Great. How do we get the x? Same thing. We just substitute our new y value in for y here or y here. Either one will work. And hey, look, we've actually got this really great thing to use. We've got x equals 5y plus 7. So we've already figured out something where as soon as you plug in y, you'll get x as soon as you just do a little bit of arithmetic. So let's plug it into this one because we made this equation from other equations we already knew, and it's going to be the easiest way to get x because we won't really have to do any algebra. We'll just have to do some basic arithmetic. So we'll plug into this equation here. So we swap out the y that we know here for negative 1. So we've got 5 times negative 1 plus 7. We simplify that, x equals negative 5 plus 7, so we get x equals 2, and at this point we've found the point, we found the pair x comma y that's going to solve both of these equations. We know that the point 2 comma negative 1 solves both of the equations above. Great. Of course, the example in the previous slide was an independent system. What we just looked at was an independent system of linear equations because it only had one solution. In the end, we only got 2 comma negative 1. We didn't get other solutions. We didn't get zero solutions. So it was an independent system. They had different slopes. So how do you tell if a system is inconsistent, no solutions, or dependent, infinitely many solutions? Well, in the case where it's inconsistent, that is, it has no solutions, then if a system has no solutions, you eventually get to a nonsense equation, some sort of equation that has to be clearly false. It can't be true. Something like 0 equals 5, or negative 8 equals 42, or root 2 equals 2. All of these things are completely ridiculous. They're absurd. You can't have 0 equal to 5. We just know that's not true. So what that tells us is that the only way the system can be solved is if something impossible is true. But you can't have something impossible be true. It's impossible, right? So therefore, the only other possibility is that the system has no solutions. There are no solutions if we wind up getting some statement that is clearly false, something ridiculous like 0 equals 1 or 5 equals 20. At that point, we go, oh, it must be impossible for this thing to be true because we're getting impossible statements out of it. So we know that we've got an inconsistent system, a system that has no solutions. On the other hand, we could also have something that is a dependent system, something that has infinitely many solutions. In that case, if we've got a dependent system, one with infinitely many solutions, you're eventually going to arrive at an equation that will always be true. Things that are going to be like 0 equals 0, negative 47 equals negative 47, pi equals pi, right? No matter what we plug in there, there's nothing to plug in, right? Negative 47 equals negative 47, they're both constants, it's always true. It's just a true statement. So since these statements are always true, just as the statement is always true, the system is always true. So we see that the system is always true, meaning that we have infinitely many solutions. And remember, I want to point out what I talked about before. That doesn't mean that any point whatsoever will solve the system. It just means that any point on one of the equations is going to be true for the other equation as well. So if you find a point on one of the lines, since the other line is just that same line, it's going to be true for the second equation as well. So we've got infinitely many solutions, we've got that entire line of solutions. You can also show this by showing that the two equations are equivalent. And we'll see examples for, uh, we'll see an example for inconsistent will be example two in this lesson, and we'll see a dependent system in example three. So if you're confused about that, you want to watch those specifically, check those out. Example two and example three, we'll explore that, we'll see how that's the case. All right. There's another way to solve, though. We don't have to use elimination. Sorry, we don't have to use substitution. We can also use a method called elimination, where we eliminate one of the variables from the equation. Doing this, we add multiples of one equation to the other, which allows us to eliminate variables. So we're able to multiply one of the equations by a number, any constant we want, and then we can add that result to the other equation, and that will allow us to eliminate variables. For example, if we've got 3x plus 2y equals 4 and x minus 5y equals 7, well, we see, hey, 
I've got an x here, I've got a 3x here. Well, if we could get a negative 3x to show up and then add that, it'd cancel it out. So we multiply x minus 5y equals 7 by negative 3. So we multiply both the left side and the right side. We multiply the whole equation. So that'll come out to be negative 3x plus 15y equals negative 21. And we know that's equal because x minus 5y equals 7 is equal. So if we multiply both sides by negative 3, by algebra, we know we've still got an equal thing. So negative 3x plus 15y equals negative 21. Now we bring these down, 3x plus 2y equals 4. Bring it down here, and we add negative 3x plus 15y equals negative 21 to that. We add those together, 3x and negative 3x, they cancel each other out. We've got 2y and 15y, they come out to be 17y. 4 plus negative 21 comes out to be negative 17. We divide both sides by 17, and we've got y equals negative 1. Great. And hey, remember, that's the same thing that we got when we were working through substitution, so that's good because both of our methods should give us the same answer. At this point, since we've got y, we can solve for x by substitution with the other equations, right? We can plug this y equals negative 1 in here or here, and we'd be able to figure out what the answer is just by good old-fashioned substitution. Alternatively, we could do it by further elimination. If we know y equals negative 1, then we see over here, hey, there's 2y. Well, we could multiply this by 2, negative 2, and we get negative 2y equals positive 2, right? Because it's negative 1 times negative 2. So we have negative 2y equals positive 2. We can add that over here, and we've got 3x plus 2y, what we started with, equals 4. And we'll add the thing that we just created to that, the multiple we just created, negative 2y equals positive 2 add that on both, these cancel each other out. We've got 3x equals 6, divide by 3 on both sides, x equals 2, so we wind up getting 2 comma negative 1, right? Both of our values there, which is the exact same answer that we got through substitution, so looks like elimination works. Cool. Just like with substitution, you can tell how many solutions the system has by the same things. Independent, that means it has one solution, the system will solve in a normal fashion. You'll wind up just getting values for the variables and there will be only one solution. If it's inconsistent, it has no solutions whatsoever, then when you're solving, you'll get an impossible equation, something like five equals eight that just can never be true. And then finally, dependent, in infinite solutions where anything on one of the lines is going to be on the other line, so the entire line is going to be answers. While solving, you get an always true equation, something that is just automatically true, like seven equals seven. At this point, we understand how to use elimination, right? We can multiply one of the equations by some constant number and then add that to the other one and eliminate variables. But we might wonder why it works. What gives us the ability to add whole equations together? Why are we allowed to do this? Why does this work? Okay. Imagine we had a simple equation, like something as simple as x equals y. We just started out at that. Now, if we wanted to, we could add 2 to each side, right? x plus 2 equals y plus 2 if x equals y. Just basic algebra. But we could also say, hey, you know, 2 is equal to 1 plus 1. And I feel like adding 2 on one side and 1 plus 1 on the other. Now, 2 equals... 1 plus 1, right? They're the same thing. So what algebra says is you have to do the same thing to both sides. So if we add the same thing on each side, we've still got equality. So if we add 2 on one side and 1 plus 1 on the other side, we're still adding the same thing on both sides. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. So we can add this equation. We can add 2 equals 1 plus 1 because the important thing is that 2 and 1 plus 1 are the same thing, right? Since 1 plus 1 becomes 2, it's just another way of expressing 2. And that's what an equation really is, that we can express it this way or we can express it this way. Both of the things on the, op both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same thing. They're equivalent. So we can take x equals y, right? We can take x equals y here, and we can add 2 equals 1 plus 1 to that, and we've got x plus 2 equals y plus 1 plus 1. Makes sense. Cool. If we wanted to, we could also start off by multiplying 2 equals 1 plus 1 by some number on both sides. We start off, we have some constant multiple. So we multiply by 3 on both sides, and we get 6 equals 3 plus 3, right? Distribution on the right side. By algebra, we know this equation is 2, right? Since we just multiplied both the left side and the right side by the same number, by this 3. So we know that 6 does equal 3 plus 3 because we just did algebra on it by multiplying both sides by the same number. So we can add it to x equals y by the same logic. We've got x equals y is what we started with. We add 6 equals 3 plus 3 because we just figured out that that's true as well. And we'll get x plus 6 equals y plus 3 plus 3. Great. 
The method of elimination is working by the exact same reasoning. The way we add an equation to both sides is because since it's an equation, it has a quality. We know the left side and the right side are the same thing, so that means that we're adding the same thing to both sides. What we're adding on the left side is the same thing as what we're adding to the right side. They might look different, but we know because of that equality, the left side and the right side are the same thing, they are equivalent, so we can add them to both sides. And this allows us to have that nice process of elimination where we can just knock out variables. All right, solving by a graphing calculator is the final thing we'll talk about uh, for ways to solve systems of linear equations. Earlier, we talked about how where the graphs of a system intersect, wherever we've got intersection, we've got solutions. Now, normally, that isn't very useful in practice. It's a great theory for helping us understand how this works, right? We can either cross once, cross never, or just be on top of each other, right? One solution, zero solutions, infinite solutions. And so that's really useful as a theory thing, but in practice, it's a pain to graph in a really accurate way, right? If we wanted to find solutions from graphing, if we wanted to use graphing, we'd have to spend so much time making accurate graphs that we'd be better off just doing the system directly, right? We've got substitution, we've got elimination, those are just direct methods that will get us the answer. So we can just use those methods if we want to figure out what the answer is exactly. If we need accuracy, it takes a long time to make a really accurate graph. So we'd be better off solving it directly if we're doing it by hand. However, it's possible to get around this if you have a graphing calculator. If you've got a graphing calculator, a graphing calculator allows you to graph both equations very quickly, very accurately. Then there's a way on the graphing calculator to find accurate intersections. You can analyze the graph and it will tell you these two lines, these two curves, intersect at such and such a point. That allows you to immediately find the solution. You graph one of them, you graph the other one, you tell your graphing calculator, look for the intersection point, and it spits out some number, and there is your point. There is your point that solves the, um, the system of equations. If you want more information on this, if this sounds interesting, if you have a graphing calculator, if you're interested in buying a graphing calculator, there's an entire appendix on graphing calculators that's got lots of useful information. And even if you don't own an actual graphing calculator, physical calculator, there's lots of programs that will work on computers, like the one you're probably using right now, or tablets or smartphones, which you might be, whatever you're watching this on right now, there's a way to be able to use graphing programs on that as well. And so you can go look those. Uh, we've talked about that in the appendix on graphing calculators as well. So there's lots of great things out there. You can probably be able to do this even without having to buy a graphing calculator. Now, of course, I want to caution you. You have to show your work in most math classes, right? So if you're taking a math class, you still have to learn these other methods of solving because it's not enough to say, hey, the calculator said so, right? You have to be able to show definitely prove that this is the case. We can't just say, hey, this piece of technology said it. And also, you don't want to become reliant on your calculator, even if you're not taking any tests, even if you're not you know, doing this and taking homework or anything else. If it's just for you, you want to understand what's going on. And while the graphing calculator is a useful tool, you get a lot out of being able to do this, understand what's going on through substitution, elimination, because that will show up in other stuff in math, whereas this graphing calculator is really useful, but it's just a trick for finding answers to this one thing. So you don't want to become reliant on your calculator, and you're probably going to have to be able to do this yourself for math class, so you have to know the other methods as well. Nonetheless, it's great for checking your answers and when you don't need to show work, right? So if you don't need to show work, like you're taking a multiple choice exam and you're allowed to use your graphing calculator, or if you just want to check your answers after you've written the whole thing out by hand and shown your work, it's a really great way to be able to do it quickly, accurately, and move on. All right. We can also expand this idea of a linear equation to more than two variables. So far, we've just talked about systems that are x and y, or maybe a and b, or uh, you know, k and l, just two different variables. But we could also have more. We could have more variables, like three variables. For example, we could have a, b, c, and d, all these capital letters be constants. And then we could have a three variable linear equation that had a times x, b times y, c times z, and then finally all equals some constant. We could take it even further to four variables, where the capital letters are still constants, a times x, b times y, c times z, d times w, equals some constant e. Or any arbitrary number, n of variables, where a, each of our a sub some number is going to be some constant, and x sub some number is going to be each of our named variables. So it'd be a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 plus up until we get to an times xn equals some constant number a0. So the idea is we can just have as many variables 
variables as we want. And as long as they're just being added together and multiplied by some constant and equal some constant at the end in this nice linear form, we've still got a linear equation. We can solve a system of such equations if we have at least the same number of equations as variables. So if you've got the same number of equations as you do variables, right? So if you've got a three variable system and you've got three equations, you're good to solve it. If you've got a four variable equation, sorry, four variable system, and you've got four equations, you're good to solve it. If you've got a 57 variable equation and you've got 57 equations, you're good to solve it. So as long as you've got that, you can work through it. We solve these systems in pretty much the exact same manner as when we did two variables. We can use substitution, we can use elimination. Graphing gets really difficult because it's difficult to visualize this stuff in higher than two dimensions, right? We can visualize three dimensions to some extent. It's hard to write it on paper since paper is two-dimensional, but we can visualize it because we're used to living in a 3D world. But once you talk about a four-dimensional or five-dimensional system, we can't really visualize four dimensions or five dimensions. How do you add an extra dimension? to space. So we're not used to just living in three-dimensional space. We're not used to thinking in more than three dimensions, so we can't really graph in it. So graphing can be hard or just straight up impossible, but substitution, elimination, they still work great. So if you encounter a, uh, an equation, sorry, a system of equations that has more than two variables, you can still use substitution, you can still use elimination, and we'll see that when we get to example five. We'll see a three-variable system that we'll work through. All right, we're ready for some examples. First example, solve the system of equations if it is possible. 3x plus 4y equals 6, 2x plus y equals negative 1. Let's try both substitution and elimination, so we'll work through it with substitution first. So if we're working through with substitution, to me it looks like 2x plus y equals negative 1. That's easy to get just the y alone. So we subtract by 2 on both sides. We have y equals negative 2x minus 1. At this point, we can plug that in here. So we have 3x, I'll switch to a new color. We bring that down. 3x plus 4 times what we sub in, negative 2x minus 1 equals 6. Work that out. 3x minus 8x minus 4 equals 6, 3x minus 8x, sorry, we simplify that to negative 5x, we add 4 to both sides, negative 5x equals 10, divide by negative 5 on both sides, x equals negative 2, right? 10 divided by negative 5 becomes negative 2. Great. So we've got our x, what our x is equal to, and then to figure out what our y is equal to, hey, we already built this nice equation, y equals negative 2x minus 1. We'll switch colors again at this point. y equals negative 2x minus 1. So we can take this, swap it out here. So y equals negative 2 times what was x? Negative 2 minus 1. So that's negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4 minus 1, or 3. So y equals 3. So the point for this comes out to be negative 2 comma 3. Great. Alternatively, we could do this through the method of elimination. So at this point, we're looking for how can we get these things to mesh up nicely so we can knock out some things, right? So 2x and 3x, we're going to have to multiply both of the equations to do it. But y, we can easily multiply y by negative 4, and we'll have brought it up to the positive 4 here. So let's start with 3x plus 4y equals 6, and then we're going to take our 2x plus y equals negative 1, and we want to knock out that positive 4, so we're going to multiply everything by negative 4. So we multiply the whole thing by negative 4, right? Everything in that equation. So that comes out to be negative 8x minus 4y equals negative 1 times negative 4, positive 4. So at this point, we bring this down. We'll add that together. We've got negative 8x minus 4y equals positive 4. The positive 4y and the negative 4y, they cancel each other out. 3x minus 8x becomes negative 5x equals 10. x equals negative 2. At this point, we can either plug x equals negative 2 into 2x plus y equals negative 1 or 3x plus 4y equals 6. Right? We can use substitution or we can just continue on our way with more elimination. So let's bring down 2x plus y equals negative 1. 2x plus y equals negative 1. And notice if we multiply x equals negative 2 by negative 2 on both sides, we'll have negative 2x equals negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4. We add this whole thing together, 2x minus 2x, they cancel. We've got y equals positive 3, 
there are two answers, and so we get the same thing, negative 2, comma 3. If you wanted to check this, you could plug it into both equations. You'd have to plug it into both equations because you can't be sure that you solved both of them unless you know it works in both of them. But you can also, if you're running low on time, you can check just one of them, and that'll probably help you figure out whether or not you got it right. So 2x plus y equals 1 equals negative 1. So we can plug in 2 times negative 2 plus 3 equals negative 1, negative 4 plus 3 equals negative 1. And sure enough, that checks out. Negative 4 plus 3 equals negative 1. We can do the same thing with 3x plus 4y. So 3 times negative 2 plus 4 times 3 equals 6. So that gets us negative 6 plus 12 equals 6. Sure enough, that checks out as well. So we've performed our check. We know for sure negative 2 comma 3 x equals negative 2, y equals 3 is the solution to this system. So checking your work is great if you have the time. If you're on an exam, you know, it's really nice to be able to check your work. So I recommend checking your work whenever you have the time if, uh, you know, if it's an exam and it really matters that you get this right. Or, you know, if it's an important problem and you're engineering something and you can't let it fail, right? All right, second example. Solve the system of equations if possible. Negative a plus 3b equals 6. Negative 3a plus 9b equals negative 27. Once again, let's see it both through substitution and through elimination. So over here, we'll do substitution. Uh, so negative a plus 3b equals 6. Let's add a to both sides. 3b equals 6 plus a. a plus 6, let's subtract by 6 on both sides. So 3b minus 6 equals a. That's the same thing. We can plug this in to negative 3a plus 9b. So we've got negative 3 times a, which is the same thing as 3b minus 6. 3b minus 6 plus 9b equals negative 27. Negative 9b, negative 3 times negative 6 gets us plus 18, plus 9b equals negative 27. Our 9b and our negative 9b cancel out, and we get 18 equals negative 27. That's impossible, right? We can never have this be true. So since 18 cannot be equal to negative 27, we know there are no solutions to this. Similarly, we can work through this with elimination. So working through this with the process of elimination, we see negative a plus 3b. So we can multiply negative a plus 3b by negative 3 on both sides. So negative a plus 3b equals 6. We can multiply that by negative 3 on both sides. And that'll wind up giving us positive 3a minus 9b equals negative 18. So negative 3a plus 9b equals negative 27. And then we're going to add what we just figured out is a multiple of negative a plus 3b equals 6, right? We have that. We multiply it by 3 on both sides. Sorry, by negative 3 on both sides. And we get positive 3a minus 9b equals negative 18. We add those two together, method of elimination. Negative 3a plus 3a, hey, they knock each other out. 9b plus negative 9b, hey, they knock each other out. Negative 27 plus negative 18, that gets us negative 45. So we have 0 on the left-hand side because we've got nothing left over there. So 0 equals negative 45. That's impossible. We can never have that be the case. So we've got no solutions. This can never be true. Great. Alternatively, one other way to be able to see what's going on is we can show that these two things are very similar. Notice negative a plus 3b equals 6 and negative 3a plus 9b equals negative 27. Well, notice that if we just multiply the left, we multiply this guy by 3, then the left-hand side is going to be the same thing as the left-hand side to our other equation, right? So we've got negative 3a plus 9b equals 18. So notice, Negative 3a plus 9b, that matches up to negative 3a plus 9b. So the left-hand side is the same, but the right-hand sides are totally different, right? So in one world, in one equation, negative 3a plus 9b equals 18. In the other world, our other equation, negative 3a plus 9b, the same thing is equal to negative 27. So in one world, we've got totally different meaning than the other world. So thus, the worlds can never match up. It means that our lines never touch. We have no solutions based on this. So one other way to be able to see what's going on is the fact that we can make the left-hand sides equal, but the right-hand sides won't be equal even when the left-hand sides are equal. Therefore, 
the left hand sides of the two equations are the same thing, the right hand sides will be different, therefore it must be never possible for the two things to meet up. Solve the system of equations, if possible, negative 3 sevenths p plus 2 sevenths q equals negative 6 sevenths, and 9p minus 6q equals 18. First thing I would do is I'd go, oi, you know, 7, divide by 7, divide by 7, divide by 7. I don't like fractions, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply the whole thing by 7. So 7 times, so at that point we've got negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6 easier to work from this point on, I think. So now let's do, do substitution first. So negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6. So we can work out, let's go with q. 2q equals 3p minus 6, divide both sides by 2. So we've got 3 halves p, 6 divided by 2 becomes 3. So 3 halves p minus 3. At this point, we've got 9p minus 6q equals 18. So 9p minus 6q equals 18. We can substitute in our q there. So 9p minus 6 times what we swap out for q. Quantity 3 halves p minus 3 equals 18. Simplify this. 9p minus 6 times 3 halves. So half of our 6 goes away. So this we can break this into 3 times 2, right? 6 breaks into 3 times 2, so that knocks out the 2 down here, and we've got 3 times 3, or 9p here, and negative 6 times negative 3. That got a little confusing because I distri was distributing, but it didn't cancel out both of them. Sorry about that. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing. Negative 6 times negative 3 gets us positive 18 equals 18. 9p minus 9p means we've got 18 equals 18, and that's always true, so we've got infinite solutions. We have a dependent system. So infinite solutions, as long as one of these two equations is true. So let's go with 9p minus 6q equals 18. So as long as one of our equations is true, we know that the entire system is going to work because we know from what we just figured out that they're actually just the same line. They make the same linear thing. All right. We can also do this through elimination. I think this way is actually easier. So once we get to this point, the negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6, we see, oh, negative 3p plus 2q, oh, we can eliminate, say, the p's pretty easily. So we multiply this one, we multiply negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6 by 3 on both sides. So 9p minus 6q equals 18. And then we multiply negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6 by 3 on both. So we get negative 9p. 2 times negative 3 becomes negative 6q. Negative 6 times negative 3 becomes negative 18. We add those together and we get these cancel, these cancel, these cancel, 0 equals 0, and that always winds up working out. So we will know that we have infinite solutions over here as well. It always winds up being the case. Great. One last way to see what's going on here is we can actually show that these two things are just the same equation. So if you've got negative 3p, plus 2q equals negative 6. Well, if we want, we can just multiply both sides by 3, at which point we've got negative 9p plus 6q equals negative 18. At this point, we multiply both sides by negative 1. We've got 9p, sorry, minus 6q, because we multiplied by negative 1, equals positive 18. 9p minus 6q equals 18. Oh, hey, that's what we started up with here, right? So the equations are equivalent. They're the, just the same equation put in different ways of phrasing it. So this equation here is the exact same thing as this equation here. The left equation and the right equation, the two equations in our system, they're just the same equation. So if the equations are equivalent, that means we have infinitely many solutions because anything that fulfills one of the equations will fulfill the other. Now, once again, remember, that doesn't mean all points are true, but anything on the line created by 9p minus 6q equals 18, which is the same thing as the line negative 3 sevenths p plus 2 sevenths q equals negative 6 sevenths, which is the same thing as the line negative 3p plus 2q equals negative 6. Since they're all equivalent equations, they make the same line. So anything on one of the equations, anything that fulfills one of the equations, fulfills both of the equations. So we've got infinitely many solutions. We've got an entire line of solutions. Not the whole plane, but a line of solutions. All right, let's try our hands at a word problem here. 
You need to make 100 milliliters of 22% acid solution for chemistry. However, the lab only has 10% and 50% solutions available. How much of each should you use to arrive at the desired acid solution without wasting any? So we're going to have to mix 10% solution acid and 50% solution acid together to finally make a 22% acid solution with a quantity of 100 milliliters. So first thing, we have to mix some quantity of the low acid, some quantity of the high acid. So let's name those things. So we've got L will be the name for the amount, which will be the number of milliliters that we use, of low acid, which is the 10% acid. And we'll use H to describe the amount of the high acid, the 50%. So L is the milliliters of 10% acid, H is the milliliters of 50% acid for low acid and high acid. All right, so if we're not going to waste any low acid or high acid, that means that the amount that we mix of low acid and the amount that we mix of high acid, the amount that we're using of both of those must come up to be together exactly 100 milliliters. Otherwise, we've gone over the amount that we're going to use eventually, so we are being wasteful. We're using too much in creating our thing. So our first piece of knowledge is that H plus L equals 100. The number of milliliters of our high acid plus the number of milliliters of our low acid must come out to a total of 100 milliliters. Our other piece of information is that we want to make a 22% acid solution. So at this point, we have to start thinking out what does it mean to be a percent acid solution? Well, that means that there is some quantity of acid there. And when divided by the total volume of whatever we're dealing with, that's going to give us a percentage number. So amount divided by volume that we're dealing with, whatever the amount of the acid stuff in there, divided by the volume, the number of milliliters, is going to be equal to some ratio, zero point something, which we can then convert up into a percent. Remember, so percent is the same thing as the decimal shifted over to the side. So 10% is the same thing as 0.10, 50% is the same thing as 0.50, and 22% is the same thing as 0.22. So for every milliliter of high acid that we put in, we will put in 0.5 times the milliliters of high acid of acid stuff going in. So with that idea in mind, we can start creating a formula here. 0 0.50, 50% acid here, times the number of milliliters, plus 0 0.10, the low acid, is the total amount of acid stuff that we have put into our mixture. And then we're going to divide it by, we know at the end we're going to end up with a hundred milliliters, so that will be our final volume. And we want that to come out to be 0.22, right? So we know that at the end it's going to come out being that. So these are our two equations. Now, alternatively, I'm gonna tell you a trick that I think is a lot easier way to think about this. Alternatively, we can think of this in terms of points, right? So every Every milliliter of 10% brings 10 points to the table. Every milliliter of 50% brings 50 points to the table. We know in the end, if we've got 22% of a hundred, sorry, we've got 100 milliliters of 22%, then it's going to be 100 times 22 points. We can think of each of the percentages times the amount of it is going to be that many points on the table. It's a sort of abstract way of thinking about it, but I think it makes it a lot easier to make these equations. So we know that if it's 10% for the low, 50% for the high, then we've got 50 times H is the number of high points that come in, plus 10 times the low is the number of low points that come in, the points mixed together. We know in the end we want to have 22 times 100 points is going to be our final solution. 22 times 100, which is 2200. So 50H plus 10L equals 2200. So we can either think in terms of the percentage that our final solution comes out as, this 0.50H plus 0.10L divided by 100 equals 0.22, or we can think of the number of points that are being put in to make our final number of points. It's kind of abstract. It doesn't really make as much sense, but I think it's a whole lot easier to understand, so that's why I'm telling it to you. 50H plus 10L equals 2200. I also want to notice, want you to notice that what we've got here and what we've got here are actually equivalent equations. If you multiply the top one, the red one, by 
a thousand, sorry, not by a thousand, but by 10,000, by 100, and then by 100 again. So the first 100 would cancel out the fraction on the left and bring us to 22 on the right. And then the next 100 would bring the 0.50 to 50, the 0.10 to 10, and the 22, the now 22, to 22 hundred, we see that we've got the same thing. So they're actually equivalent. It's just this multiplication. So this point method and the uh, percentage method, they're going to wind up giving us the same thing. But I think the point method is a lot easier to wrap your head around in terms of the mechanics of creating it mathematically. And it's an easy, fast way to create it on a test when you have a, a low amount of time on your hands. So I recommend thinking about it. But if you don't like it, don't use it. All right, at this point, we're ready to solve it. Solving it actually won't wind up being that hard. Uh, I'm in the mood for using elimination because we've got these nice H's and L's. They're just raring to go. We can multiply them by negative 10 pretty easily. So we know that negative 10H minus 10L equals negative multiplied by negative 10, so negative 1,000. We add that to 50H plus 10L equals 2,200. So negative 10H minus 10L equals negative 1,000. It gets added together here. So these cancel out entirely. We're left with 40H equals 2,200 minus 1,000, 1,200. 40H divided by 40 on both sides. We've got 1,200 divided by 40, or 120 divided by 4, which is 30. So we know H equals 30. And then from h plus l equals 100, if h plus l equals 100, then we know 30 plus l equals 100, so l equals 70. Great. So in the end, these two pieces of knowledge, here and here, means that we want to add 30 milliliters of 50% solution and 70 milliliters of 10% solution. And that's how we'll build our 22% acid solution with 100 milliliters in the end. Great. Example 5, solve the system of equations if possible. 3x plus y minus 2z equals negative 6, 4x plus 1 half y plus 2z equals negative 5, and negative 3x plus 2y minus z equals 9. All right, so this is a three variable uh, system of equations, but ultimately we're just going to use substitution and elimination. We can either stick just to substitution, stick just to elimination, or use a combination of them. I'm going to use a combination of them because I feel like it. But I want you to know that you can really use any method. Any method, as long as you're careful with your work, you're making sure you don't make mistakes. Either method will work, a combination of them, you can switch over. Sometimes the easiest thing won't be obvious and you just have to sort of try fiddling with it for a while and then you'll figure out what it is. So just play with it. Even if you're not quite sure what'll be easiest, just get started on it. Things will work out in the end. All right. So at this point, I notice we've got 3x here and negative 3x here, so I'm going to add those two equations and I'll get cancellation. 3x plus y minus 2z equals negative 6, and negative 3x plus 2y minus z equals 9. We add those two together, sorry, put a line under it. 3x and negative 3x, they cancel out, so we've got 3y minus 3y, 3z equals positive 3. Let's divide everything by 3 to make it a little bit simpler. y minus z equals uh, sorry, not 3, but we divided by 3, so y minus z equals 1. Okay, now uh, we'll come back to that in a few moments. And now we also might see, oh hey, there's a negative 2z here, there's a positive 2z here. We can add those ones together as well. 3x plus y minus 2z equals negative 6, and 4x plus 1 half y plus 2z equals negative 5. Now, if you wanted to, you could have previously just gone to substitution once you had y minus z equals 1. You could have gone to substitution from the beginning, but I decided to start with elimination because I saw these things that could cancel out easily. 3x plus 4x, 7x, plus 1 half plus 1 becomes 3 halves y, negative 6 plus negative 5 becomes equals negative 11. Great. So at this point, we've got stuff involving x and y and stuff involving y and z. So if that's the case, we want to sort of overlap for the y. We want to be able to figure out what y is. So let's get everything in terms, let's get y the guy who's not going to be substituted out. So y minus z equals 1, we'll change that into z equals y minus 1, right? We subtract by y, then multiply by negative 1 on both sides. z equals y minus 1. And over here, we can get what x is equal to, 7x equals negative 3 halves y minus 11, 
or x equals negative 3. We divide that by 7, so that will become 14 minus 11 over 7. Great. Now, that's not that friendly to substitute, uh, but that's what we got to at this point. It might have been easier if we'd gone with a slightly different method, but we've got something. We can work it out. Might be a little bit more math than we were hoping to have to do. Might be a little bit more, you know, number crunching, but it's not going to be that hard to work through. So at this point, let's figure out which one we want to plug it into. Let's choose 3x plus y minus 2z uh, equals negative 6. That'll be fine. So 3x plus y minus 2z equals negative 6. Now, we know that x is equal to this stuff over here. So we've got 3 times negative 3. Oh, whoops. That was one big mistake here. Forgot to put that y down. Sorry about that, guys. So negative 3 over 14 times y minus 11 over 7 plus we don't have anything substituting for y because we want y because we're going to solve for y at the end of this minus 2 times and over here z is equal to y minus 1 equals negative 6. We start working this thing out 3 times negative 3 over 14 will become negative 9 over 14 y minus 33 over 7 plus y minus 2 y plus 2 equals negative 6. Let's compact some stuff together. We'll compact our y's to what we can. Negative 14 over, negative 9 over 14 times y. And we've got the y here and the minus 2y here, so that'll become minus y. And let's, we can't really combine 33 over 7 and 2 very easily without bringing in more fractions. So let's just subtract them to the other side because we know eventually we're going to have to subtract them to the other side. So we subtract by 2 on both sides. Negative 6 minus 2 becomes negative 8. We add by 33 over 7 on both sides, so we get plus 33 over 7. Okay, now at this point uh, we can... I don't like dealing with the fractions here. So at this point, I'm going to just say, let's get rid of the fractions as opposed to trying to put things over common denominators. We're going to get rid of those denominators eventually. So we'll just multiply the whole thing by 14. So 14 times this whole thing. That'll get us negative 9y minus 14y equals negative 8 times 14 becomes negative 112. And 33 over 7 times 14, well, that'll cancel the 14 to uh, just 2 times 33, right? The 14 divided by 7 becomes 2. So 14 times 33 over 7 is the same thing as 2 times 33. So that's plus 66. Well, that's negative. And so negative 9y minus 14y becomes negative 23y. Negative 112 plus 66 becomes negative 46. Divide by negative 23 on both sides, and we get y equals positive 2. Great. So there's our first thing. At this point, we've got these two equations. We've got our z equation and our x equation. So it's just a matter of plugging into those. z equals, plug in our 2 for y, 2 minus 1. So z is equal to positive 1. That one's pretty easy. This one is a little bit more difficult. We've got x equals negative 3 over 14 times 2 minus 11 over 7. So that gets us negative 6 over 14 minus 11 over 7. Actually, you know, it's easier. Let's just cancel out 2 times 14, sorry, 2 over 14 becomes 7. So that'll cancel the denominator to just a 7 minus 11 over 7. So that gets us negative 6 minus 11. Whoops. Wow. Let's go back a few moments to before I made that mistake. So negative 3 over 14 times 2. Well, we can break this into 7 times 2. So the 2's cancel out, and we've got negative 3 over 7 minus 11 over 7. Negative 3 over 7 minus 11 over 7 gets us negative 14 over 7, because they combine. They've got the same denominator. So negative 14 over 7 simplifies to x equals negative 2. Great. So at this point, we found each of our values. We found our x value, our y value, and our z value. So in the end, we know that the point that works in all three of these equations is negative 2, comma, 2, comma, 1. Great. Now, once again, I'm just going to say you could have gone through, done this in other ways. You could have used just substitution. You could have used just elimination. You could have combined them in a different way than I did here. There might have been an easier way. There probably was definitely going to be a harder way as well. But you start, you wind up just choosing one way and you work through it, and eventually it will wind up working out. You know, as you go, as you do more of these problems, you'll figure out what works better, what's easier for you, a general sense of how to get these things done fastest. But really, it's just a matter of practice and just slogging through it sometimes. All right, final example. 
And what if we wanted to solve this system of equations? u plus 2v plus 7w minus 3x plus 4y plus 2z equals 41. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. Well, notice we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 variables total. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 equations total. So we know this is possible. So we could solve this system of equations, or at least we could figure out, does it have no solutions? Does it have one solution? Does it have infinitely many solutions? This is horrifying. I don't want to do this, right? Yuck. Solving this problem with the methods we know now would be possible. We could work through this with, with elimination. We could work through this with substitution, but it would take us forever to be able to work through this thing. It'd be awful. It'd be this huge slog. It would just take us so much paper. We could get it done, but I don't want to. And it turns out there's some great ways to do this. We've got some tricks up our sleeves. Later on, when we uh, understand vectors and matrices, we'll be able to see how to solve a monster like this in the lesson using matrices to solve systems of linear equations. You'll be able to use what you know about matrices, matrix multiplication, matrix inverses, things that we'll all learn about in the future, don't worry. You'll be able to learn all of this stuff and you'll be able to see there's a really, really easy way to be able to just knock this stuff out. If you've got access to a calculator so you can compute the inverses easily, you'll be able to just knock this thing out really, really quickly. Solving this thing will be a piece of cake once we talk through this stuff. So we'll actually come back to this many lessons in the future when we get to using matrices to solve systems of linear equations. We'll take this thing and we'll be able to knock it out like that. It'll be really, really easy to work through, which is pretty darn cool. All right, so I hope that you've got a good idea of how linear uh, systems of linear equations work. Um, it's all about figuring out where the thing's intersecting in terms of that. That's really the idea of when are these two things going to be true. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.